it'll be good if we can get this uh, first session of the afternoon underway. So if there's anybody waiting outside to join us, can you please make your way in? And if you have a particular interest um, in the life sciences and antibiotics using open source tools and you're likely to be wanting to ask a question, please come down to the front because it's a big hall and it is a lot easier for us to um, hand over the microphone if you're closer to the front. All that being said, I'd like to introduce our next speaker to LinuxConf Australia 2012. It's uh, Kai Blinn, who has, uh, I believe, travelled some distance. Uh, he's a computational biologist by trade and an open source developer by passion, which makes a great combination. Uh, being more of a network and systems programmer in his spare time, a uh, Samba team member, he feels uh, lucky to also work in open source software on his day job. And uh, during the day, he is helping identify new antibiotics to combat diseases, uh, both at the computer and on the lab. Uh, computational life sciences, of course, is an enormous field these days. Scientific computing is something that Linux has been very strong in the past, and we are making enormous head roads in that field um, now and in the future. So without much further ado, I'm sure you can all give Kai Blind a very warm welcome. Thanks for the nice introduction. So, uh, I'd like to announce before I start, um, I'm taking up the DSD on the challenge. So I've got a bit of binary code down here. Whoever managed to decode it has a pretty good job at landing a job in my department. Or it's a graphics driver bug and I apologize for it. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, what I actually wanted to talk about <laughs> is the software that I'm working on, Anti-Smash is a secondary metabolite analysis shell, which is a, fancy, a bunch of fancy words. So let, before I go into all of this, let me give you a short primer on the biology side, because without the biology background, ah, great. Presentation software, got to love it. Uh, so let me go into the biology background, because without this background, the rest of the talk pretty much does not make much sense. So I've tried this in a couple of friends, and um, I have enough background there that made their eyes stop glazing over. If you have any questions during all of my talk, during the introduction or during the later parts, feel free to ask questions at any time. So as you might have seen on the first slide, I work in the microbiology biotechnology department at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Now, biotechnology. What is this all about? Well, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity defines biotechnology as any technological application that uses biological systems, living organisms or derivatives thereof, to make or modify products or processes for specific use. That's quite a mouthful, and um, I'll get into more details because nobody understands that. I don't, and I work in biology. Anyway, what I will say this is about is, in biotechnology, you take a living organism, such as a bacterium or yeast, and turn them into little factories that produce things you want. So this is basically the point where I have to disagree with to the, this morning's keynote. We actually do have factories that do self-reproduce. They're just not big, they're small. Anyway, a popular example for a factory that we use that pretty much everybody has benefited from already is beer. It's the oldest or one of the oldest biotech applications on the planet. And we're using a specific kind of yeast to turn sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Now, um, this has been discovered ages before people got even the idea of calling something biotechnology. And by some hardcore definitions of biotechnology, this is not really biotechnology, but I think the folks who actually built a brewery over in the cafeteria would disagree. I think this is biotechnology. Anyway, different example. We have bacteria that produce insulin that we use to treat people who suffer from diabetes. Now, why do we actually bother 
with uh, using small organisms to do all this work because it's pretty tricky to handle all of these instead of going for a chemical synthesis. I, I mean, ethanol is a pretty trivial molecule. It's pretty easy to synthesize if you really want to. Now, in some cases, like yeast producing ethanol, we don't have to do anything. I mean, the Egyptians discovered this probably because some, some of the stuff they were storing just spilled, uh, uh, got spoiled, and turned out to be better in the end. Um, so why bother doing all this fancy chemical work if it's just already done for us by nature? Now, going back to diabetes, uh, treating diabetes with insulin, the uh, bacteria we use don't need insulin. They don't naturally produce insulin. So we had to engineer them to do this. So why do we do that? Before bacteria were engineered to produce human insulin, the best we could do was to kill some pigs and isolate insulin from them, which worked, but wasn't too great. Now, if we have a bacterium, oh, ah, whatever, um, that, that'll do. So there's supposed to be a test tube around this, but I underestimated just how flat the picture would be. Anyway, just imagine a test tube around this. Um, we start with one little bacterium, and we pro provide enough food, and they will multiply. And we have a lot of little bacteria, so we have a lot of little biofactories that run our production line. So here we, we're heavily building on the fact that we actually have self-reproducing factories here, because one little bacterium would not produce enough insulin to make worth all the fuss. But you can build a huge fermenter with thousands and thousands and thousands of liters, dump some bacteria in there, wait for a day, and it's full of bacteria, and then you start your production. So, to produce things, our factories, our little biofactories, need machines to do the job. In nature, these machines are called enzymes. So, we're calling them enzymes if they actually do some chemical reactions. Now, there's a couple of other machines the cell actually needs as well. So there's um, sensors that tell the cell what's going on in the environment. There's regulators that allow the cell to react on whatever the sensor is telling them. So the cell can find food or avoid a toxic substance or whatever. And the nice part, and that's what we need for reproduction, is there is machines that build new machines. These things are called ribosomes, and they will be coming back in later parts of the presentation. Now, because in nature we can't really count on the things staying the way they are, nature changes all the time, our bacteria have a lot of different machines they can use to deal with the environment. This, of course, would be very inefficient if we had to keep all of these machines around all the time. So what we're actually seeing in bacteria is that instead of keeping all the machines, they have a blueprint for every machine. And every time they need a specific machine, they just go grab the specific blueprint and then go on and produce the machine. Now, the, the blueprint is called a gene in biology because we want to be different. Now, while I'm dealing with all these names, something that might crop up later and might be a bit confusing. So if I'm talking about how the machine is built, so I'm really looking at the parts it's made from, I usually call it a protein. And if I'm talking about what it's doing, I'll call it an enzyme. This is something that dates back to the days when people didn't realize these two were actually the same things. And depending on what background you're coming from, you're talking about one of the, or the other. And I'm not always consciously thinking about uh, in which context I am. Um, so it might slip, uh, I might slip between those two. Um, just so it's clear, if we're talking about the building blocks, we're usually talking about a protein. And if we talk about the, what it does, we're talking about an enzyme. So let's get back to the protein part and look at what proteins are made from. 
So these blueprints I was talking about, the genes, are stored in nature's universal storage system. Everything of, that's living uses the same storage system with the same encoding to store its genes. This is very convenient because we only have to figure out how that works once. So the molecule that this is stored in is called desoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA in short. DNA was discovered in 1869 at the University of Tübingen. Um, in this lab, in the basement of the castle of Tübingen. Uh, this is actually the proof that uh, geeks have been working in basements for ages and they have discovered cool things. Now, the, the basic way uh, DNA works is we have a linear backbone down here that is the desoxyribose. And on this backbone, we have the molecules that actually contain the information. So this is like the carrier, and we have the molecules that contain the information called adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And those actually carry the information. And the whole thing why DNA is so successful and used universally is because it's very stable, because it comes with a backup copy right with the original one. This is an inverse complement copy, so it, basically the, the way the molecule is built is the other way around. And the nucleobases, these little parts that store the information, they complement each other. So adenine and thymine complement each other and cytosine and guanine complement each other. So for every piece, you have the inverse piece on the other side. This allows you to replicate because you can split the cell. One gets the one copy, one gets the other half, and you can just, from the half you have, reconstruct the complete set of information. And this also means that while you're not splitting up and doing all the copying, this is very stable. So this is a very robust molecule. It's very, very hard to actually break that. You can break it, but it's really hard to do so. Yes? How do you know the arrow goes that way? So the question was, how do I know which way the arrow goes? So what I didn't present here is that this is a chemical molecule that has, this is a sugar backbone. The ribose is a sugar. And at some point, chemists decided which way you would name the connections. So basically just by the chemical setup of the sugar, you know which direction it is. If you're later sequencing this to get the genetic data as a huge list of A's, T's, G's and C's, you don't know which way around this is. You don't actually know which strand you're working on, but it doesn't really matter. So usually you would see this in this double helix that's twisted around each other because in real life this actually winds around each other pretty tightly. And um, it's probably too small to really see that, but it's not really important for the talk. There you see the sugar backbone as actually much more complicated than this little line I showed. And from that you can deduce the chemical uh, direction. Now, going back to proteins, proteins are built from a set of 20 building blocks. These 20 building blocks, they're called amino acids, build up all the proteins a ribosome can produce. So every th single machine that an organism has are built of those 20 blocks and combinations thereof. So this is basically Lego invented way before people invented Lego. Now, right, so to store this on DNA, I've recently, I, I, I've shown you that um, we have four different letters to store information. Now, to store 20 different combinations with four different letters um, give, gives us the size of the byte nature uses. So, I mean, if we do the math, we know that one letter can store four combinations, two letters can store 16 uh, 
different combinations, but we need 20, so nature uses a three-letter alphabet of these bases, so these ATGCs. Not to con be confused with the ATGC you can build from these amino acids. Biologists like to do this confusing. Uh, it's great fun if you come into this as a computer scientist and think, well, well, wait, what's going on here? Anyway, so you store these 20 amino acids in three-letter words uh, in the, on the genome. And to visualize how this actually is translated, you usually have these sort of codon wheels where uh, it's a nice visual help to figure out what's going on. And if you look at like the top left row, it's ATG going out. This encodes methionine. Yeah, so the ATG and you have the M on top, methionine. There's three special cases here because even in nature you have lots of special cases. And that's the TGA, TAA, and TAG, all of which tell the ribosome, okay, end of the blueprint. It's basically nature's end of file marker. Now, what actually goes on is a bit more complicated because you usually have the DNA, but you only have one copy of it. So you don't want to pass the DNA around to tell the ribosome what to build. So what you usually do is you use a second, or what nature does, is there is a second molecule called ribonucleic acid, or RNA, that is the copy of the DNA, and that is then sent out to the ribosomes to build whatever uh, the ribosome should build. So there's slight differences in the backbone that cause the name difference. This is chemistry again, it's not important for the talk. There's one of the nuclear bases that is slightly different. That's why it has the different letter. It's also not very important. The thing is that you have one copy of DNA, but with a backup. An RNA is one strand, which means it's less stable. You can't do as much funny things with it and it still survives, but it's much easier to work with because you don't have to figure out how to open it to read it and all of that. So this one is the, the working copy that you usually send out. So just because this is so important, it's called the central dogma of molecular biology. You go from DNA to mRNA to protein. It always works that way. Or so we thought. Anyway, there's always exceptions, like all absolute rules, but it's a very good rule of thumb. Most normal organisms do DNA, mRNA, protein. There's only a few exceptions. Nasty viruses do funny things, and I'm going to have an exception later in the talk, but that's usually the way it goes. Now, blueprints that are often used together because they're building these machines are building yet something more complicated, so you need them together, are usually stored next to each other on the genome. In order to visualize this, because bi biologists by nature are very visual creatures, in order to visualize this, you usually use these colored arrows. The direction of the arrow tells you which of the strands you, you're actually reading from. Yeah, so we have two strands, they go in different directions, and both of them have blueprints and both of them have backups. There's no primary strand and no backup strand. That's why you can't tell the difference, actually. You just pick one of the strands and decide that's the main one and the other one is, is the reverse one. And that's shown in these uh, arrows you have here. So you will be seeing those later in the, in the talk as well. This usually means if they're really close together, they're doing something related. Actually, in, in this particular case, you, you can actually think, see that the ones that are close together on the left side, they all go in the same direction. They're usually read together and translated together. And the ones that go in the other direction probably don't belong to these group of uh, genes. So this is information you can actually infer from the organization. It doesn't work all the time, but it works most of the time. Now, next thing I want to talk about a bit about is the metabolism. 
The primary metabolism is everything that is involved with carrying on living. So, eating, energy, reproducing, everything that takes care, so all the processes that happen in the cell that take care of carrying on living are called the primary metabolism or just metabolism. Um, so, this is what you can use for some of the biotechnolo uh, biotechnology applications. So, if a yeast cell is eating sugar to stay alive under low oxygen conditions because you locked it up in a, a barrel, then it will produce ethanol as toxic waste. So, what you're doing is you're actually recycling toxic waste if you're having a beer. Something to think about. From the position of a yeast cell, you might see that differently. Now, primary metabolism implies there's something like a secondary metabolism. The secondary metabolism is everything that is not involved in surviving, or not directly involved in surviving. A good example would be uh, pigments that color the petals of flowers. If a plant is not able to produce colored flowers, it won't die, at least not right away. I mean, in, in a couple of generations, bees might decide that this flower sucks and we're going on to the other flower, but you won't die right away. It's not completely necessary. Um, the same goes for the secondary metabolites I'm interested in professionally. Um, antibiotics. So antibiotics are interesting. You can actually, sorry, for the media guys, I have to show an example. There we go, sorry about that. Anyway, um, so because it's, this I found in a US convenience store. It's a triple antibiotic ointment. And this is the reason why I still have a job. Um, I'm, I, as far as I understand, uh, as much as I understand, you can't just go and buy this in, in Australia, just off the counter. You probably need a receipt for that. Um, I got this cream of Walmart. It's also triple antibiotic. It cost me $3. So, br brilliant stuff. I like it. It gets me more work. Anyway, 70% of the antibiotics on the market are produced by streptomycetes. These are bacteria on an agar plate. They look a bit wrinkled. They look colorful. And they actually are the beast that produce the smell of freshly tiled earth when you are in agriculture and somebody just tiled earth, these are the things you smell. It makes it nice to work with them because you open the uh, breeding uh, container and it smells like freshly tiled earth or forest or something like that. Anyway, so let's, let me get into why antibiotics work and how they work. So, taking this cell, there's a couple of things you can attack if you want to kill that cell. Now, the first and obvious thing you can attack is the cell wall around the cell. Because the cell wall is needed by the cell to keep all the other components that are inside, inside, and everything that's outside, outside. Now, penicillins and all the derivatives of that, they attack the cell wall. And if they succeed, the bacterium just blows up and is dead. But for all the other steps, you also have antibiotics that target these steps. Nature has been at this for millions of years. And bacteria have been killing each other with antibiotics for ages. Now, it would be really hard to come up with something that does that yourself. But fortunately, as I said, nature has been at this for a while. So what do you do to find new antibiotics? Actually, it's just you pick some bacterium. That you, uh, you have a bacterium that you want to kill. You pick some other bacterium, and you just see if that produces anything that kills that bugger. So, how do you do that? Well, the usual way of doing this is you have a plate where you grow the bacteria you're interested in, and then um, see if you put little paper discs on this, and on that you put substances that might be interesting to you. 
And depending on how big this halo around the paper disc is, you can see how poisonous or how toxic this is to the bacterium you want to kill. This, incidentally, is a more uh, organized approach to what Alexander Fleming did 80, 80 years ago when he discovered penicillin, because he noticed one of these uh, areas where his bacteria didn't grow around this stupid mold that was growing on his plate. Anyway, why do we need more antibiotics? Well, I've already said it. Um, if we look at this map of Europe, you can see the color changing from green to red as we go further south. This is the number or the percentage of patients in hospitals that have an infection that is not curable by any penicillin we know. So if we're going to the Mediterranean states, every fourth patient you can't cure with penicillins anymore. This is going to be a huge problem. I don't have any numbers for the Australia that, or nothing that's current. The only thing I found was a 1999 ABC report that cited between 20 and 40 percent of the patients in Australia having the same issue. Unfortunately, penicillin is still our blockbuster antibiotic and the other ones all sort of suck against that. Anyway, how does that happen in the first, way, uh, first place? If you have bacteria, some of them will be more resistant, some of them will be less resistant. If you use antibiotics and kill off the less resistant ones, but you don't completely kill all of them, the more resistant ones will survive. And because they now have no competition whatsoever, they'll start and grow. So in the end, you've drastically increased the average resistance level in all these bacteria. Okay, so now let me get to the one exception uh, I'm going to present where the central paradigm doesn't work. This is called the non-ribosomal peptide uh, synthesis, uh, synthesis. And there, instead of going with all this mRNA ribosome uh, story, you build a huge factory enzyme that, like a real factory, has different modules that do different steps over and over and over again. And by this, you gradually, like building up a car, you build up a product. The nice thing about these beasts is that, unlike a ribosome, which is limited to these 20 building blocks, you can build those things to do all funny sort of modified building blocks. So this is where the special Legos come in. So these are the things that actually are really interesting in uh, the area of antibiotics, and that's basically one of the forties of our software. I'll get into that in a bit. Now let me get started with uh, my actual talk, having the introduction finished. Please remember the biology part, I'll be handing out graded tests after the talk. Uh, uh, sorry, giving talks in university lecture halls always gets me into teaching mode. AntiSmash is uh, a software that is my PhD project, and we're cooperating with a couple of other universities. So I'm working at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Um, I'm working on this with another developer at the University of Groningen, Netherlands. And there's also uh, some guy working at the University of California, San Francisco in the States. Now, going at our software, this is something that's typical for an academic project. Our main pipeline is written in Python. For historical reasons, we have some Perl code. I was actually surprised myself when I put up the statistics that our historical reason Perl code is actually half our code. Um, anyway, the C++ code is actually ex an external tool that we have to uh, drag in. We, don't, we, we try to avoid doing development in C++. <laughs> Whoever wrote this didn't actually read on software design. Anyway, um, as you can imagine, with this great set of different languages we have to work in, it's very easy to find students who can actually work on this. Unfortunately, with, as with mo most academic projects, you can't easily go and find people that uh, contribute to your software if you can't publish it before you published it in a journal. This is a bit annoying if you're coming from a traditional open source background. 
Anyway, the whole pipeline itself is pretty standard, I guess, for a web application. We have a web app that takes the user input because, as I said, biologists like graphical interfaces, and our idea of a graphical interface was a website. We dump that stuff into a database so we can run the actual anti-smash pipelines on a different machine because that actually needs to be a really powerful machine and that can be really some old hardware we have left over. Now, let's, let me walk you through how the software works if we get a gene sequence in there. Because, as I said, a gene sequence is nothing but a long, long thing of A, T, Gs and Cs. And it's not even sorted. Now, how do you go on with gene finding? Well, let's go through this as an example. So, here I have a short sequence and let's find some genes. Now, what we're looking for is ATG, because that also means start. So humans are pretty good at pattern recognition, so with a bit of practice you can do this rather well. So anybody found all of them? So these are the ones I found. Oh, sorry, yeah, there's GTGs as well, because sometimes start doesn't mean start, and sometimes something that doesn't mean start means start. Um, nature for you. Um, Okay, let's repeat the process for the stop codons. Stop codons are TGA, TAG, and TAA. Those are the ones I found. And now comes the fun part. We, ha we now have to find start codons that have stop codons in a distance that is that divides by three without leaving any rest because we always read in uh, word sizes of three. So these are the ones I found. There's the short one up there, and there's a longer one down there. And we actually have another one or two left over there. So the GTG and the TAG up there, they are possibly a gene, and the ATG and the TAA there are also possibly a gene. And the main logic you have in gene finding programs is to figure out what the heck you're doing when you have a situation like this. Um, usually you take the longer one, but in this case this doesn't work. So you're trying to do something like, oh, let's pick the one that looks most like the other ones I found. We tried a couple of implementations for this um, and tried to find some, something that's accurate and reasonably fast. And we ended up going with the Glimmer tool, which is a great project. Um, it's released under the Apache license, but it's also an academic project, so good luck getting any patches in. Now, the next thing we have to do once we found the genes is to identify the gene clusters related to secondary metabolites. I mean, we can find lots of other gene clusters, but who cares? Um, so, we're not using, when identifying gene clusters, the DNA sequence, because the DNA sequence has this nice feature of having multiple ways of encoding some of these things. Remember, we have 20 combinations, and we have 64 words that we can use with a, a three-letter uh, three word size. So what nature does is actually it encodes different things using different words that mean the same thing. So in the end, we go for the protein sequence, which is much easier because you don't have to count to three all the time, and you only have one letter that tells you what the heck you're looking at. Now, how do we do this, uh, the, the cluster identification? The cluster identification works by building up a profile. To build up a profile, we collect, for everything we're interested in, all the sequences that we already know are the thing we're looking for. We put them under each other and try to figure out at which position we find which amino acid. This tells us how we can build a profile that we can use to then evaluate new sequences we're getting in. So if, if we put this in, there's a high probability of having those blue amino acids at this position, and if we have those at this position, we get, get a high score. If we get a high score, that's probably the same thing. We're using the Hammer software, which is another great tool and it's licensed under the new GPL. Um, it's one of the US Jamelia Farm research projects. And it's pretty bloody fast. It's really great. I, I love it. The old version um, didn't work quite as well. The new one has a 60 
time speed increasing uh, inc improvement. Good job. Now, that is how we build our part of the. So this is most of our know-how. I mean, it goes on for a couple of uh, meters below the floor, of course. But basically, much of our know-how is if we've identified these little parts using the profiles we have, and we have identified a couple of other profiles, and we haven't identified a couple of other profiles, then we think this is a gene cluster of this type. And we basically have a very complex rule set that builds up all of this. Uh, it's a bit like SAT solving, just that you don't deal with only binary values, but actually with scores. Now, once we've identified all these clusters, we want to figure out what they're doing. Because if you're looking for new antibiotics, you don't want to find something you already know. So in this case, uh, so we compare our cluster with already known clusters. So in this case, we're comparing the cluster on top with the other clusters below that. The first one looks like a pretty close match. So the cluster we have, we've identified on top probably isn't too interesting, too bad. The similar colors here mean probably similar function. But for the big ones, this is actually cheating because all we identify is this is also one of these big factory line enzymes. And they all look pretty much the same, at least on this rough level. But the surrounding is usually interesting. Now, if we identify one of these mega enzyme clusters, this is where the fun part starts. Because this cluster actually breaks down to have a lot of little modules. And if we figure out what each module adds to the complete product, so we have all these factory line steps going on, and if we can figure out what every of these modules does, we actually know what the product is. Even if this is something we've never ever seen before. Just as long as we've, we know what all the modules do. And this is exactly what we can do to help people who work in the lab. Um, we do this by using a support vector machine. And I assume that everybody here uses support vector machines every day, and I don't really have to go into this, but let, let's do a quick refresher. Um, support vector machine actually deals with um, dividing or uh, classifying these two different sets of data points by um, a hyperplane. You, you work in a multidimensional space, and you divide them by a hyperplane. In my example, the multidimensional space is two-dimensional, and the hyperplane is called a line. Now, if you want to divide this, minimi uh, minimizing the error, you would go for something like this, probably. And now, once you've trained the vector machine how this line is supposed to go with all the data you already know, you can use this to guess in which class the new data point goes. So, I mean, if you would have to take a guess, it, it would probably be a circle, right? So that's the idea of the support vector machines. In reality, of course, we use a couple of thousand dimensions, and it gets much more fun, but it's very hard to visualize it. Now, if we figure out every single module on the way, we can build a chemical structure that tells the biologists or the chemists in the lab what they're looking for in uh, if they culture the bacterium. This is very helpful, but unfortunately doesn't always work. It's a bit hard to read, but up there, there's something that says um, residue equals one, which is our software that's for some reason failing to just put a question mark or an R there, um, saying, I don't have any clue what this module is about. But apart from this, the, the prediction actually is pretty good. So this is on an antibiotic we already know. The final product has a chemical bound going across here again, because it's actually in a circle. But nobody has figured out how to actually do this uh, and predict this in real life. Anyway, let's go to uh, how we represent our data. Um, we figured that we wanted to support all sorts of platforms. So we decided to go for a web front end, because you don't have to worry about all these nasty details in different operating systems. Turns out that the browser is the new operating system. So of course, if you do a web thing and you develop in Firefox, what's your first user going to use? Something different. If you're lucky, it's Chrome. 
if you're not lucky, it is an Internet Explorer. Um, oh well. Anyway, what we're doing is we built up a result page that has um, different components. We do this lot of work because we actually have a standalone version that runs without a web server. And um, in order to make that work, we actually have to build an XHTML page that runs standalone. Uh, apart from Chrome, where you can't run local JavaScript content. But we build up um, HTML page, we build up vector graphics, we build a couple of P PNGs for the chemical structures. And in case somebody actually wants to go on and not look at the pretty pictures, but actually work with the data, we also have a comma-separated value list. Um, yeah, for the front end, I just want to give a short shout out to the um, nice pieces of software we're actually using. We're using the Flask um, web development software uh, framework in Python. This is um, a very nice framework that is really low fuss. It doesn't really it doesn't really push much on you. Um, you don't have to run a bunch of different libraries that you don't actually want to use. It's really, really nice. We're using the SQL Alchemy plugin with this and the mail plugin, and we actually, I wrote my own plugin that handles downloads on behalf of our users. Um, yeah. We're running an SQL database, and we're building our web stuff with jQuery because we have to put pop-ups on the SVGs, and that turns out to be very easy using jQuery SVG. Now, I'm trying to do, uh, I'll try to do a demo. We're a bit uh, short on time, so let me just get the demo started. It will run a while, but I'm happy to take questions while the demo is running, and then we'll see if we can get back to the demo. Uh, okay, let me just go and start up software. Okay, so this is the web front end, pretty basic, nothing fancy. Let me turn off some of the more expensive analysis parts and let's get going. And let's hope it works. There we go. We're running. So while this is, this is going on, let's uh, take some questions and hopefully within the time we have allotted for the talk, this will actually finish on my laptop. We're usually running this on a 24-core uh, box that is a bit more powerful than what I can bring here. But unfortunately, this is currently moving server rooms, so I can't use it for my uh, presentation. Okay, so any questions? Seems like I have, oh, no, there are some questions. Not a question, but uh, I, there was a guy in Adelaide that was doing a grep for this sort of DNA searching. Um, so the comment was that there is somebody in Adelaide who has grep. It's a grep DNA search. So he said he called it DNA grep or something or right? other. OK, so apparently there's something that searches genes in DNA using a grep-like interface. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So what we're using for searching genes, if, if we have an annotated or if we're looking at specific genes, is that we're using BLAST. BLAST is the industry standard for searching for sequences, and it's very easy to convince people that you're using some sensible piece of software because every biologist, and more importantly in academic uh, context, every reviewer you have for a scientific paper you submit will know what BLAST is. Um, using more fancy approaches is always a bit harder to get published. So this is something, again, if you're developing software in the academic background, um, you have to pay attention to what is publishable in a scientific journal before you have to care about what is publishable as software. 
which is why most of our competition actually does not release their source code, because they just put up a website and say, okay, done. And I'm very happy that my employer actually gets that for science and for freedom, it's important that you actually release the code. That was a question over there. Now that this is written, is your research just CPU bound? Um, the, the question was if my research is just CPU bound the way we've implemented the, the pipeline. It is pretty CPU bound if we are trying to do a full analysis of, of the genome. Um, we're usually, if, if we're looking at um, how much data we can actually pump in there, we're probably just limited by the amount of data that is available. Um, so the complete pipeline the complete pipeline that is running here is pretty quick on the whole genome. So I'm, I guess if I had a week or two, I can probably run most of the published sequences of bacteria and a month or two to run on, on uh, molds and other um, small yeast-like fungi. Uh, they just have much, much bigger genomes. I mean, for, for bacterium, we're looking at um, millions of bases, and for um, eukaryotes like yeast, we're looking at billions of bases. So, but I mean, this is basically just string searching. I mean, there's nothing fancy in there, apart from the vector machine approach, which, which actually takes into account that you have um, the proteins that are built up, they have a complex 3D structure, and the parts that actually do the job are very few of these building blocks, and the rest is just scaffold, uh, scaffolding to get the building blocks in place. And as long as you get the important blocks at the position where you need them to be, uh, everything is fine. And sometimes this is the outside, so the scaffolding is very diff uh, different. So the profile-based approaches don't work, which is where we have to use more complex approaches like the, the vector machine. But um, yeah, basically we're just chunking data and going over things. Um, is the core of your algorithm uh, written in C, or is it in Python? You said the majority of code. Um, the, the core of our algorithm, the question was, if the core of our algorithm was written in C. No, it's not. Um, that possibly would be a speed increase. Um, it also would make it much harder to find people who can actually work on this. My co-author is a biologist who taught himself how to program. Um, while this makes for interesting discussions on things like code structure, um, it is still very good to have people who actually know the biology part work on this. Um, and that's so much easier in Python. Um, I don't think this is very critical. I mean, compared to the lab work you have to do to confirm the results, Having to wait an hour more for the results doesn't really matter. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes over. I'll just take this last question from down the front here. Okay, just a comment on... Sorry, how, it's good that you said that you're able to release the source of this program, but given that a lot of the other steps in the pipeline are going to be performed by proprietary academic new software, um, do you have any thought to expand and say write a structural homology search program or a synthesis program to just complement this and take this all the way to developing an actual antibiotic and then releasing the source? Um, so the, the, the question is a very interesting question. Um, this is, while our software is open source, a lot of the steps we're using are proprietary or only free use if you're an academic institution or something like this, and what steps would be needed to take the whole process of actually identifying a new antibiotic completely open source. So we're actually not running a single software, a piece of software that's not freely available. So everything we ship and everything that we depend on is open source. Um, the only thing that is probably not open source um, is the database we use for the complete genome annotation, and it looks like my demo isn't working. I didn't pay enough sacrifice to the demo gods, sorry about that. Um, if you're interested, we can take this outside and I, I can show you how the software looks like. Anyway, um, I think the really hard part in developing a ready antibiotic that you can use is the process you have to go through to get the 
medication verified, so all the state, uh, the country's requirements of uh, the FDA in the US or uh, I don't know what uh, department this, uh, does this in Australia. And this is really expensive and you can't really uh, go, get around that. But I mean, the rest of the process is pretty easy to do. Uh, assuming we have uh, the uh, sequencing uh, machines, open hardware as uh, promised in this morning's key, uh, keynote. Okay, so thanks a bunch. Okay, we'll um, wrap up now. Thank you, um, Kai, and please everyone um, put your hands together for uh, giving our appreciation for his presentation. Um, Linux Conference Australia 2012 would like to offer you a gold-plated penguin. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll have like a five-minute...